Hi, and welcome to another open day of the Law Simplified's online law school. I'm Shravin Bandar Nayaka. In this open day, we are going to have a look at contract law, specifically um, answering a question on agreement. Now, once we start the online law school, we'll be doing sessions on a daily basis for criminal, contract, public, tort, trust, and property, um, with plans on expanding those subjects as well in the near future. Um, if you're interested in signing up or enrolling for the online law school, make sure you check out the links on display right now and in the description in this video. Um, and as always, um, if you have any questions in terms of my private masterclasses, we can surely set those up as well. Just drop me an email and we can take it from there. Right, this is just a quick um, sample of what we'll be going through um, in our online law school as well. So let's jump right into it. In today's open day, we're going to have a look at a question on agreement and I'll help you um, dissect and figure out how exactly we can break down a problem question of this caliber. So let's firstly read the question out loud. On the 1st of May, Arnold offered by email to sell his car to Bertha for £10,000. He also stated that he would send his wife to Bertha's house on the 8th of May to receive Bertha's reply. On the 6th, Bertha sent an email to Arnold saying, would like to have the car, can you offer a six month guarantee against mechanical breakdown? On receiving the email the same day, Arnold sold the car to Christopher and sent a messenger with a note to Bertha's house to tell her of this. Before this note arrived, Bertha changed her mind about the need for a guarantee and posted a letter to Arnold accepting the latter's offer. This letter was lost in the post. Advise Arnold. Right, now this is a very succinct question and it's a problem-based or scenario-based question as I like to refer it. And the very first thing that we do whenever we see a contract law question specifically on agreement is understand two things. First, we need to find out who exactly that we are advising, who we are, um, who we are consultants to, so to speak. So in this question, we are advising Arnold. So essentially, we are advising the offeror, the person who in fact had a particular car for sale. The second thing we need to identify is the notion that um, while this is a one paragraph, quite simple question in itself, you need to know that any question on agreement, which is any question on offer and acceptance, is essentially something which is chronological in nature. By and large, nine out of 10 questions that you will be uh, presented with or you'll encounter will essentially present itself as a series of statements, some of which might amount to offers while others won't. So it's up to us to figure out which statement amounts to an offer, which statement amounts to a mere invitation to treat, which statement amounts to a simple supply of information, and finally, what kind of statements in the question actually refer to a proper acceptance and thereby who the parties are bound to. Now this question, you will have to go through it one line at a time. So let's start from the very beginning. It says, on the 1st of May, Arnold offered by email to sell his car to Bertha for £10,000. Now, in order for an offer, much like in Stora and or Gibson, in, a, in order for an offer to be succinct and valid, there are certain criteria that it needs to fulfill. Firstly, it needs to be unambiguous, it needs to be on certain terms, and it needs to be communicated by the offeror in a manner that it can only extinguish itself by virtue of acceptance or some other extenuating circumstance. Now, in this question, it's very clear, we have been told in the question itself that Arnold made this offer by email, he has stated the subject matter, in other words, the car, he's also stated what he wants for it which is 10,000 pounds. Also, the recipient is quite clear, and therefore it's not essentially a unilateral offer, it's specifically made to a particular person. Right, so we are told there's a car, it's 10,000 pounds, and this has been sent on the 1st of May. In this same mail, he states that his wife, as in Arnold's wife, will visit Bertha's house on the 8th of May to receive Bertha's reply. Now, there are two key things that we need to understand from this particular line. Let me just highlight it quite real quickly. So this particular line indicates to us two things. One, he has indicated, as in Arnold has indicated a particular method or he has stipulated a means by which acceptance is to be provided. He has said, 
If you agree, Bertha, what you need to do is wait for my wife. My wife will come on the 8th and she can tell you. Now, the moment you see something like this, what needs to work in your head are things such as the postal rule, um, the modes by which communication happen, as well as expeditious methods, methods that are faster than what has been suggested. Um, we'll just leave it at that for now and we'll move on. On the 6th, Bertha sent an email to Arnold saying, would like to have the car, can you offer a six month guarantee against breakdown? Now, two days prior to, let's say the deadline that Arnold has set, Bertha sends an email, which is in the same format that the offer has come. So we are all right at this point, even in this question, stating, would like to have the car, can you offer a six month guarantee against mechanical breakdown? Now, essentially, this can be one of three types of communications. It can either be an acceptance, it can either be a request for information, or quite noticeably, it can be a counter offer. Depending on which path you're taking, your answer will differ dramatically. If it is an acceptance, which it is not, but if it is, hypothetically, if it's an acceptance, then that's it. Essentially, Arnold is liable to actually sell the car to Bertha. If it is a mere request for information, which I would argue for in this, re in this regard, it doesn't amount to anything. The offer still stands, the deadline of the 8th is still there, all you have to do is mention that and move on. The third um, context, the third type of communication would be a counter offer. If you're going to argue in the notion of a counter offer, essentially what would happen is Arnold's original offer is no longer valid because there is a new condition which has been added to it. Essentially, she wants a car to be sold, uh, to be bought for 10,000 pounds, it's completely fine. But apart from that, she also wants a six month guarantee. So let's presume um, in this line of thinking, in this argument, remember there is no right or wrong answer, only weak or strong arguments. It's always a many shades of gray, so there's many parts you can take and it's all up to your argument. Presuming though that it is merely a request for information, and the offer still standing. Um, it states that on receiving the email the same day, Arnold sold the car to Christopher and sent a messenger with a note to Bertha's house to tell her of this. So essentially in this um, context, Arnold has now concluded his contractual obligations of selling the car to someone completely different. And in order to inform that the offer is being revoked, he is sending a messenger. Now this creates two problems. Firstly, the conventional wisdom is that if you have made an offer and if you are revoking the said offer, almost the identical principle of the postal rule should apply. Either you should use the same method by which the offer was made or a more expeditious or a faster way of doing it. Now on the facts, it's clear that Arnold has emailed his offer, but now sending a note, which is a far slower means of communication than an email, um, to Bertha to inform of the revocation of this offer. Before this note arrived, Bertha changed her mind about the need for a guarantee and posted a letter to Arnold accepting the latter's offer. This pretty much creates another issue, which is there's an email with an offer, there's a stipulation by Arnold suggesting that, that he will send um, his wife to get the response, but she has sent something completely different. She has sent something slower than the email for that matter. And to make things even more complicated, at the very last instance, it says this letter was lost in the post. In essence, what the examiner is trying to show you is that if at all an acceptance was valid, if this is a valid acceptance, would it be vitiated or negated because of the postal rule, as in Adams and Linzel? Now, there are multiple facets, there are multiple things that we can think of in this question. And whenever we attempt a question like this, always remember your conclusion is only secondary. The primary thing that you need to focus on is your argument and to show the examiner that you have articulated and you have thought of this in a very analytical, logical or a rational manner. That's what's most important. These type of questions in agreement or in relation to contract law are very interesting because they are chronological. If we are to presume that certain statements are not exactly um, what the examiner or for that matter the framing of the question is your outcome is completely different.
So in the online law school, we'll be doing much more questions of this caliber, things which are much longer and a bit more complex as well as the weeks go on. So I urge you to enroll. Um, you can do so by following the links on screen as well as in the description. And um, I will see you in class. So until such time, have fun, stay safe, and as always, obey the law.